Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School series on the doctrines of salvation. Appreciate you joining. And um, what a great study this has been so far. We're just getting started. A few weeks ago, we looked at man's part in salvation, which is repentance and faith. Uh, We repent and we trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And then we saw that God's grace leads him to uh, save us. And last week we looked at the doctrine of regeneration, where God actually makes us a new creature and we're born again in Jesus Christ. Today, uh, we're going to focus on the doctrine of adoption. Uh, We'll have many other doctrines we'll be looking at of salvation. I'll share those at the end. But today, if we want to start in John chapter 1 and verse 11, we're going to be focusing on adoption, the beautiful doctrine of God adopting us into his family and us uh, gaining a new father, if you will. So in John chapter 1, look at verse 11. The Bible says, He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So notice the Bible's very clear that we become the sons of God when we receive Jesus Christ. We become his children and so we are essentially adopted, adopted into a new family. Go over to Galatians chapter 3 now, verse 26, if you would. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. And the Bible here again gives us the connection between when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and us becoming a child of God. Galatians three twenty-six, Very simple verse, but look what it says. For ye are all the children of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. So when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we become children of God. We become God's children. And then over in Ephesians 1, just one book over, I want you to look at verses 4 to 6 with me in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 4. It says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, the focus of this this passage is that we are in Christ when we're saved. But there God said in verse 5, he predestined us unto the adoption of children. That is what our focus is today, that we are adopted into the family of God. And then in verse 6, it says, the end of the verse, we're accepted in the beloved. In other words, because we are now adopted into God's family, because we are now part of Jesus Christ, we are now perfectly acceptable to God. Not because we're righteous or worthy of that acceptation, but because we are in Christ. And so we become part of Him. So we become accepted in the beloved. And then while we're walking through these church epistles, go to Philippians chapter 2 now. In uh, verse 15, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. So notice the Bible says that we become the sons of God when we are Christians. We become part of God's family. And if you would look over in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. And notice what the Bible says here. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm going to ask my technical department just to come and make sure I'm still recording because my screen went blank. But uh, notice here in 1 John chapter 3, over in verse 1, the Bible says we should be called the sons of God. We become the sons of God when we become Christians. And it says, verse 2, now... Are we? So it's not something in the future. It's something that happens at salvation. We become children of God, part of God's family. Praise the Lord. We get a new father. 
So th these verses show the truth of the adoption, but now I want us to look at some of the, the, the truths that come along with the adoption, and that is when we become children of God, we become join heirs with Jesus Christ. Now this is, this is quite beautiful. We are adopted into God's family. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We become a Son of God. And so essentially his inheritance becomes ours and our inheritance as well. So let's look at Romans chapter 8 and we'll see this. And this is a very beautiful aspect of becoming a child of God is the inheritance that comes with it from our new father, our heavenly father. Notice Romans chapter 8, if you would, over in verse 14. Uh, down through verse 17, the Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Isn't that interesting that God refers to the Holy Spirit as a spirit of adoption? Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we get a new relationship with our Creator, our Heavenly Father, to where we can cry, Abba, Father. Now that word Abba in, in today's language would be more like calling our father Daddy or Dad. And I know that we would not feel comfortable doing that, but it still shows that we now have a special relationship with our Heavenly Father. In verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit moves in and now becomes that witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. And it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So notice, we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So the, the, the inheritance, we know that Jesus inherits a kingdom and, and many beautiful things as the Son of God. The Bible says we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So he's the child of God, we're a child of God, or he's the Son of God, we're a Son of God, and his inheritance becomes our inheritance. Go to Galatians chapter 4. We're talking this morning about the amazing doctrine of adoption, how we are adopted into God's family. And, and we, we saw the scriptures that drove that home, but now we're, we're seeing that because we're adopted into God's family, we also become joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and his inheritance is our inheritance. Notice Galatians 4, quite a long passage, but very important, verses 1 to 7. Now, this, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, that's Jesus, of course, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So there's that word adoption again. Verse 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There is that sweet relationship we have now. Verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So again, when we became children of God, when we were adopted into God's family, we received an inheritance. Now, we haven't actually received it yet, we, all, most of it, uh, until we get to heaven, but we are now joiners with Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will see this again. <clears throat> and God actually gives us a little bit of a description of this inheritance that we receive. 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 4. The Bible says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So our inheritance, I mean, you think about earthly inheritances and how they can be lost in stock markets or whatever. Look, at it says it's incorruptible and it's undefiled and it doesn't fade away. That's God's description of our inheritance. And then it goes on to say reserved in heaven. So God has reserved for us an inheritance in heaven because we are now children of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So one more verse, Revelation chapter 21, on the inheritance that we receive because of 
our new relationship with God now that we've been adopted into his family, become his children. Notice Revelation 21 and verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Inherit all things. So as children of God, now that we're adopted into God's family, we have this amazing inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us. And God says we will inherit all things. So we are now children of God. We're adopted into God's family. We have a new father. We have a new relationship with our heavenly father, our creator, that we can cry, Abba, Father. And we have an amazing inheritance waiting for us. Beyond that, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, we looked at this verse last week when we talked about regeneration. But as children of God, we even receive a new nature. So we're in a new family. We receive a new nature. You know, last week we talked about regeneration or the new birth. God's adoption is very different from an earthly adoption. In an earthly adoption, it's a legal thing, and they do a bunch of paperwork, and the parents become the adopted parents. But with God's adoption, we're actually born into a second family. You know, when we're first born, we're born into our first family, our fleshly, earthly family. But when when we get saved, we're actually born again into a new family, <clears throat> rebirth, if you will, and become children of God, and he adopts us into his family, but it, we actually become a new person, as we talked last week, a new creature. And God talks about that new nature here in Second Peter 1, verse 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So God now says we are partakers of a divine nature. Why? Because we are a new person. We are in a new family. We even get a new nature. Now, as children of God, go to 1 Peter 1.14. This is very important. We have a new father. He is our heavenly father. And he loves us so much. But what is his desire for us as his children. And God expresses that here uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now, as earthly parents... The one thing that we desire from our children more than just about anything else is obedience, isn't it? God wants the same from his children. He wants us to be obedient children. That is our way of expressing our love for the Lord. You know, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So he wants us to be obedient children. Now, what's the other side of that? As parents, what do we do when our children are disobedient? We have to chastise them. Our loving Heavenly Father chastises us when we are disobedient. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 and, and see this. So it's, it's two-sided. On the one hand, we get a new nature. And on the one hand, God's now our Heavenly Father. And we have this sweet new relationship with Him. And we can cry, Abba, Father. But He is our Father. And He loves us. And He cares about us. And He wants what's best for us. That includes chastising us when we need it, just like we should our own children. So notice Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Look at verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. That's us. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So in other words, if, if you're a child of God, there we have, will be a time in your Christian life when he... He chastises you because we all make mistakes. Verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, so there again, we're all going to have it, then are you bastards and not sons. So born of the wrong family, if you will, the wrong parents. We, we all know who that is. So God makes it very clear that when we are born again, when we're birthed into a new family, we are also adopted into God's family, and we become his children. But this adoption can't be undone because it was by blood. And along
along with this adoption, as we saw, comes a sweet new relationship and fellowship with our Heavenly Father such that we can cry, Abba, Father, and also comes with it an amazing inheritance. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, and it fadeth not away. And the Bible teaches that as, new, as children of God, we receive a new nature. And as children of God, he wants us to be obedient children. That's our way of expressing our love for him by obeying his commandments. And as children of God, if necessary, God will chastise his children in love, as we saw there. Earthly fathers chastise their children. Our heavenly father chastises his children. So what a blessing, this doctrine of adoption. Just another one of the beautiful truths that, that is, comes along with our amazing salvation when we're, when we're born again in Jesus Christ. So we trust Jesus Christ. We repent and we trust Christ. We exercise faith in him. God, through his grace, regenerates us. But God also then adopts us into his family. We become his children. And um, that's a beautiful truth. Now, next week, we'll be looking at the doctrine of substitution, where we find that Jesus Christ became our substitute when he died on Calvary. After that, we'll be looking at imputation, redemption, justification, atonement, propitiation, preservation, sanctification, and glorification. So a lot to cover, but uh, again, I appreciate you joining us for our Sunday school here on this wonderful Easter Sunday. And I hope this was a blessing to you. And we'll see you again for the morning Easter worship service at 11 o'clock. Thanks and God bless.